thank you very much for inviting me to this talk. And, um, okay, I should click this one forward. So, uh, where do I point it? Right button. <laughs> right button. The right button. Yes. yes. Towards which computer? <laughs> yes. Ah, ah, it works. Okay. So, the title of my talk, you can see it here. Um, and I will move on to the first slide. Okay. So, uh, the leaky pipeline. I don't know if you heard about this, but this was a term coined by uh, scientists in the 70s to describe the fact that in the 70s in the United States, there were lots of women and men uh, attending universities. But they noted that the women seemed to leak out of the system. And this was at every uh, part of the career ladder. And then when you came to the highest academic uh, career uh, position, professorship, there were very few women and an enrichment of men. And um, uh, together with Nicole Duval, who will speak later here, uh, we wrote a report in the year 2000 of, uh, on women in science. And here is an illustration from this report. This is what is called a, science, uh, a scissors diagram, where you can see that students at universities, it's more or less 50-50 men and women. But then, as you step up the career ladder, in these countries, Belgium, France, Germany, Netherlands, Spain, UK, uh, women drop off steadily, and uh, men are enriched. Um, one problem facing women and, uh, and men pursuing uh, uh, scientific careers is that there's a gap in resources. Women get less uh, funding than men. I will come back to that too. So um, uh, the reason why I'm here is because I did this study that was mentioned together with my co colleague Angus Holt, and where we could prove that women are perceived to be less competent than men. So how did this start? Well, actually, uh, Agnes, my colleague up on the right here, and myself and two other uh, young women were applying for postdoctoral positions at our department in Göteborg in Sweden. And this was a national uh, competition for these uh, positions at the Swedish Medical Research Council. We were young, optimistic, wondering who of us would get the position. You can see from the uh, cartoon, none of us got the position. And actually, in fact, out of the 114 applicants, um, half, half men and women, all of 22 of the positions were awarded men. And you can see the picture of the Medical Research Council's information brochure that uh, a ratified candidate is a man. That was already decided beforehand. So we, uh, Agnes and myself, thought there was something fishy here. We couldn't really accept this. So we decided to, to uh, from the, the personal, this became uh, political and uh, we started to do science on it. So we actually tried to understand what was going on. We got uh, the records from all these 114 um, applicants. And you can see here that the chance of getting a, one of these positions was 11% for a woman who had published more than or uh, 10 uh, articles, which was actually lower than the chance of a male applicant who had published none or up to four. <laughs> so um, this led us to do a, a formal uh, scientific study. And the most important results are shown here. Um, on the left, you see the competence score. The evaluators um, gave the applicants. And you can see that there are two curves, one for women and one for men. And you can see that on the right, uh, the women who scored the highest only scored on the same level as the least productive men. On the x-axis, you can see the productivity. So um, what we found was that the women were, uh, as a group, awarded lower competence uh, scores and uh, a very high publication, very high productivity was required for a woman to get uh, a so-called male score. 
So this was published in a, a prestigious journal, Nature, in, in 1997. And the most important findings then were we tried to make mathematical models to to, to um, uh, uh, define what parameters actually uh, were predictive of the competence scores. Scientific productivity, that was expected. Gender, were, being a woman, was negative. But also, personal affiliation with a peer reviewer was also uh, a positive and very strong predictor. And we could quantify the impact of uh, uh, these predictors. So a woman needed to produce 2.6 times more publications than a man to get the same score. And an applicant without ties needed to be 2.4 times more productive. And you can imagine a woman without ties, how difficult that would be. <laughs> so clearly, there was prejudice in how women were viewed, how they were judged. Now, prejudice uh, uh, is, of course, something that has been studied, too. And um, already in the 80s, um, uh, papers were being written about how if a composition is written by uh, what the uh, uh, evaluator believes is to be a woman, it will score lower than if the evaluator believed uh, the writer was a man. In the same way, if a painting is painted by someone uh, they think is a woman, it will also re receive lower scores than uh, uh, if you think the painter is a man. And clinical psychologists have made studies <laughs> where they have um, experimental situations where they have uh, men uh, and women evaluators watching men and women completing certain tasks. So if a man is viewed uh, being successful, it's more usually attributed to the man's competence, whereas if a woman is successful, it's usually more believed to be the result of hard work or of being lucky. And conversely, if um, uh, a man fails, it will more easily be attributed to uh, bad luck, but if a woman fails, to incompetence. So the way we are viewed is different. And uh, Agnes and myself, we looked at uh, how the evaluators rated uh, the applicants regarding something which is very uh, negative in science, and that is to uh, lack independence. And you can see um, the same number of women and men were actually judged to be lacking in, in, in independence, but for, for a woman, who was judged to lack in independence, she had no chance of getting a position. But for a man, it was actually even better than the average uh, success rate. So very different uh, standards. And how fascinating the research proposal was uh, that was presented by each applicant was also judged by the, the, the evaluators. And you can see that for a woman to get a position, her pro uh, 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 proposal had to be very interesting. But for a man, uh, it could uh, suffice for it to be moderately interesting. And in science, and I suppose it's in other areas uh, where you make a living, uh, one is evaluated a lot. And of course, if um, a group, women, uh, always get a little harsh, more harshly judged, that means they will get a little less funding, they will be able to do a little less research, they will publish a little less, and this becomes a vicious circle, which is uh, described by Virginia Valian in her book, Why So Slow? The Advancement of Women. Are kids to blame? Uh, uh, kids are usually uh, blamed for the failure of women uh, in work life. But actually, when it comes to academia, uh, studies do not uh, um, show that this is the case. To the contrary, uh, uh, there are no studies showing that women having a family or being married have lo lower scientific productivity or poor career outcomes than single women. And actually, it seems as if uh, for women, uh, it's maybe even a protective factor within academia. 
Um, another subject uh, which I think is important to understand why things are the way they are are sex stereotypes. Uh, people love to, to stereotype. I think it's something human to do that. Uh, here are the results of a, a study which was published in Science uh, a few years ago where they actually looked at how sex stereotypes impacted on young women uh, and their uh, ability to perform well on math tests. So they had a group of women uh, who all were quite good at maths at uh, college level, and they were divided into four groups, and they were asked to take a series of math tests. In between, they were also asked to read a, a composition. They thought that this would have to do with uh, a comprehension of a reading, but actually the purpose of this was to see how uh, 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 different types of uh, knowledge would impact their ability. So they, uh, uh, one group read uh, an article showing that <coughs> women and men score equally good at math. Another group read a paper on the role of the female body in the arts. A third group read uh, that there are uh, differences in math uh, aptitude because of genes that are found on the male Y chromosome. And a fourth group read that men get higher scores, but that's only because uh, teachers are prejudiced. And you can see, uh, this had a clear impact. Uh, so the women who read uh, the papers showing that there are no differences, or if there are, they are because of prejudice, they scored high. The women who just read this paper on the body, uh, 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 a female body in human art, uh, in, in art, uh, scored quite low and the same about the genetic uh, paper. Uh, so uh, this tells us that we are extremely influenced by um, uh, judgments and, and these sex stereotypes to the extent that it actually uh, impacts ne negatively on our um, performance. And this has been shown for other uh, groups uh, that who are underprivileged. So, Lawrence Summers, uh, a prestigious person, of course, who used to be uh, the president of Harvard, he made a, a big uh, blunder, I think, in 2005, when he uh, said that women are underrepresented in maths and engineering because of a different availability of aptitude. What he meant is that the women are not so uh, brilliant and therefore could not you know, perform well in math. He was actually forced to resign because of this, and I think this was correct, because this does have a huge impact on how all these scores of, of, of young women who thought they were good at math, you know, look at themselves. And uh, maybe some of them failed some math tests because of this. Um, women are welcome in some places, but not everywhere. And what are these places? Uh, well, this is a very interesting uh, study in science that appeared this year in January, uh, where they discussed this concept of brilliance, of being a genius. And um, what they did is that they uh, sent out questionnaires to over a thousand uh, different uh, uh, people. These were uh, faculty, postdocs, graduate students, uh, at a whole number of research institutes in the United States, both public and private, and both within <laughs> science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the so-called STEM uh, uh, disciplines, and also uh, 18 uh, social sciences and humanities. And what they did was they asked these uh, uh, people, uh, what is required to achieve success in your field, to become a top scholar? Is it being brilliant? And there were lots of questions about that. Is it being dedicated, working hard? Lots of questions about that. Uh, or is it some type of uh, uh, abstract thinking versus insightful thinking that is required? And they also asked how selective is your research field? Uh, how, <coughs> what is the uh, acceptance rate of applicants for PhDs? And what they found is that there were differences, of course. And here you can see um, uh, the, the science uh, disciplines, and you can see uh, their measure uh, of how welcoming an area was for women was the percentage of female uh, PhDs. And you can see that molecular biology was most welcoming, more than 50%, and then it dropped off, and you can see that 
uh, math, engineering, computer science, physics were the least uh, welcoming. <coughs> and then they did correlation analysis to see whether they could see what correlated to the percentage of women. And what they found, and this was uh, the central finding of their uh, paper, was that there was a scale from the left, less important to be brilliant, and to the right, very important to be brilliant, to be excellent, to be a genius. And you can see, I hope, that there is a very strong negative correlation. So uh, fields where it's perceived that you need to be brilliant have much lower frequencies of women as compared to f fields where uh, hard work uh, 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 could, uh, is believed to be important. This was for the, uh, the science, uh, natural science uh, STEM subjects, but this identical uh, figures were seen for social sciences and humanities. So on the, on the left, you can see education, psychology, anthropology. That's, uh, those are fields where uh, brilliance is not required. And then you see at the far uh, end, philosophy, where you apparently need to be a genius. And obviously, a woman cannot be a genius. <laughs> so they also tried to make mathematical models to predict what areas would welcome women. And they found it was a very strong negative predictor to be within a field where uh, the, the notion, the concept is that uh, you are, have to be brilliant and there's some type of inborn talent that is required. Work demands, working long hours, was neutral. Competitive disciplines were positive for women, actually. It was not quite significant, but borderline statistical significance. Um, abstract versus intuitive thinking, there was no difference. So the conclusions of this paper was that uh, areas where there is this belief that you have to have this mysterious uh, quality, brilliance, inborn talent, are not welcoming to women, and you will find a lower percentage of women in these fields. Money is important, as we all know. Uh, here's a, a picture which I took from the Global Wage Report of 2014-15, uh, made by the International Labor Office in Geneva. And you can see here the uh, salary income brackets, the lowest on the left, the highest on the right. And you can see that there's a wage gap. Women earn less than men in Belgium, for example. All the countries in the Union are uh, depicted. And you can see there's a certain percentage that is uh, explained and uh, uh, another percentage that is unexplained. And you can see that in the higher income brackets, the unexplained section becomes quite big. Explained would be, for example, uh, you know, uh, working part-time or having, not having the same uh, academic qualifications and so forth. Um, I think everyone knows about this. What shocked me quite was uh, uh, these pictures. If you look at the top uh, three countries, Sweden, Lithuania, Slovenia, here the, the authors have actually calculated that the uh, unexplained part of the wage gap is so much bigger than the ex explained one for these countries that if things were fair, women as a group should actually be earning more than men. I've always been thinking that, you know, we as women should expect the same pay, but maybe we should actually expect more pay in certain countries. So you have to think, uh, change our way of thinking, perhaps. And resources are important to scientists, of course. Here's a study from the National Cancer Institute in the USA, where they found that the uh, uh, women researchers had uh, two-thirds of the budget, two-thirds of the research staff, and, this, uh, uh, and they were also less productive. But if you took that into account, you could see no difference in, in productivity. So that was completely dependent upon resources. <coughs> so um, Agnes and myself would publish this paper, uh, first uh, in, in newspapers in, in Sweden and then as a scientific uh, paper. And uh, uh, what happened was that the Swedish Medical Research Council had to resign. Uh, and then uh, after that, they have actually been very good at uh, monitoring success rates. So they want for the percent of applicants 
uh, male and uh, female to uh, be matched by the success rate. But around the year 2000, uh, the Swedish government and the uh, policymakers decided to change gears. So what they did was this. They started what are called centers of excellence, and these are extremely fashionable. And this has become a, a, a very big problem for women scientists. Huge amounts of money are given to a few select groups. And you can see one woman, all men. And this is um, during um, uh, this new millennium, uh, 1.6 billion euros have been spent on these centers of excellence. And that's uh, about half of what the Medical Research Council gives out to all disciplines of science. So it's a huge investment in these uh, centers of excellence, which have caused a huge backlash in Sweden. So 21% uh, of the senior researchers are women. About the same percentage get the grants from the Swedish Research Council now. And very few women get the excellence grants. And if you look at the large sums, it's only 4% who get the largest grant uh, sums. So what this has happened is that excellent grants, uh, whatever excellence is, have now uh, transferred uh, women uh, m uh, money from a female scientist towards a male scientist. Uh, it's stop. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I haven't been looking at the sign. Okay, so um, uh, we stop here. Uh, and I think I'll do this. What's our good path for women scientists? Well, work hard. You have to work hard to be able to get a position. But you should also, of course, have fun. You get a family because that seems to protect you, support other women, and be knowledgeable about gender issues. I think that's important so that you don't feel that there's something wrong with you necessarily. You have to be vigilant uh, regarding the percentage of women. And uh, Agnes and myself here, we actually got a, a prize for our work. And this is important, this is symbolism, that women are uh, awarded prizes for, for work. So I will end here. Thank you.